Welcome to my podcast, Why Didn't Anyone Tell Me This? With my guests, we are discussing health issues, questions you may have about your health and debunking some of the myths around our health. And it's an absolute pleasure today to be talking to Dame Leslie Regan, who is Professor of Obstetrics and Gynaecology at Imperial College, St Mary's Hospital in London. And she graduated from the Royal Free Hospital School of Medicine in 1980 and pursued her career at Adam Brooks Hospital in Cambridge, completing an MD on miscarriage, which we'll come back to later. And then she went on to set up the world's largest recurrent miscarriage clinic at St Mary's Hospital. Now, Leslie was the 30th president from 2016 to 2019 of the Royal College of Obstetrics during which time she co-chaired the National Women's Health Task Force and published the Royal College of Obstetrics Better for Women's Report, which highlighted the need for an NHS-led women's health strategy. And that's what we're going to talk about today. So Leslie was awarded a DBE for her service to women's health in 2020 and also in that year became chair of the Wellbeing of Women charity, who do absolutely fabulous work around women's health. And then she became the first ever Women's Health Ambassador for England in 2022. So welcome, Leslie. Thank you for inviting me, Joyce. Always a pleasure to speak to you. Thank you. Now, I always start asking my guests to tell us about their early years and their development to their career and what made you want to become a doctor? Well, I've pondered this a lot because there were no doctors, there was nobody in healthcare in my family. Um, my family didn't have very much money um, and my great step up and my great, um, my great stroke of luck, I think, was the fact that my father was, was a great believer in educating girls. And um, I'm, you know, my late 60s now, Joyce. So uh, when I was a little girl and born in the 50s, um, that wasn't the norm, particularly for kids coming from my, my socioeconomic background. But he was passionate about um, educating girls. Um, I think it was probably because his mum was illiterate. Um, and I remember my granny very, very fondly. She was a lovely, lovely woman, but she couldn't read or write. Um, and I think he just had this absolute conviction that what he needed to do for me as his daughter was to ensure that I had a really good education. So um, why did I become a doctor? I don't know, apart from the fact that I did have terrible, terrible hay fever as a little kid. And I used to have to go and see my doctor every week, my GP. And uh, he would give me these desensitizing injections, which didn't work very well, actually. But I just thought he was a very, very nice man. And I always felt better after seeing him. So um, you know, uh, perhaps that was it, I don't know, but I, I announced apparently on my seventh birthday that I was going to become a doctor, um, and that was it really, and uh, I, had a lot, I had a lot of trouble getting into medical school because I was a complete dunce at physics and chemistry, but um, I, I am, I've got a determined streak, as I think you know, and so after getting a bit cross when I left my, my school um, at 18, having ploughed my physics and chemistry, I then pulled myself together and I went off to the local polytechnic, as they were called then, and I redid my chemistry and I got into medical school. Fantastic. I, I love that. So many people have amazing journeys to get where they are. And it's so motivating, I think, and inspiring to hear how someone of your position, you know, one of the most, I, I do consider you one of the most important women in the UK um, to have risen oh. to the <laughs> no, seriously, risen to this wonderful position. Now, before we go more into all the amazing work that you've done and, and women's in general, I wanted to ask you about juggling being a mother and a doctor. We are both a mother of twins. Uh, mine are 18 now. They're almost ready to, to fly off to uni. And you also have four stepchildren. So how did you juggle everything you did? Well, it wasn't, wasn't easy, and I, I, I never pretend about that. I used to go to work for a rest on Monday morning. It was absolutely exhausting at home, because I, I, I had, at that time I had four stepchildren. Um, and then Jenny and Claire, my twins, who were 31, they were born in 19, December 1992. They were premature, um, so that was a very important learning curve for me. 
because I knew an awful lot about obstetrics and neonatology. I knew nothing about being a pregnant mother, and I knew nothing about being the mother of premature babies who were in special care. It was one of the most humbling experiences of my life. And I think it really changed how I how I practiced as a doctor after that. Um, I would get really, really quite cross with the junior staff or my colleagues if on the ward round, um, the, you know, the obstetric ward round, they didn't know what had happened to a woman's baby. Um, and, you know, because often, you know, you, you we, we train our juniors, don't we, in silos and they'd done the obstetric bit, but and they didn't think they needed to go to the neonatal unit. And, I would, you know, I, it was legendary. At the end of the ward, ward round on the postnatal ward, I, I would walk up the stairs to the neonatal unit and we'd go round all the babies as well. Um, but it was difficult. It was difficult. And I, I, I threw money at it. Um, almost all my salary went into childcare help. We had a, you know, we had a live-in nanny during the week, but I was, I was in charge at the weekend. So that's why I went to work, work for the rest on a Monday. And it was it was a big juggle, and I used to feel incredibly guilty about things. Um, going away to a conference, I was always the last person to arrive and the first person to leave, and you know. Um, but there we go. It, 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 we we got through it, and and I always worried that I was late for sports day, and you know, and I never went to the the, the yoga classes with the yummy mummies, and I never went to the coffee mornings. But you know, you're going to find Joyce that when your eighteen year olds fly the nest and go off to uni, they're going to come back and tell you how wonderful it is that you've got a life of your own. And that's what Jenny and Claire did. They told, kept telling me that they were so glad I had a life of my own because the helicopter mums, those yummy mummies doing the yoga that I never went to, when their kids went off to university, they were bereft and they kept following them there. I'm probably, you know, being much too uh, characterising here, but, you know, for the most part, I, I think that my two really, really uh, rate the fact that they were brought up to be quite independent. Um, and as a result of that, I, I have the, the most wonderful close friendship with them both. They're very different characters, although they're identical. But uh, I, I really treasure, I really treasure the friendship we have. Yeah, I, um, you know, I agree with you. My, my kids actually have already told me that they're really proud of me and proud of the work that I've done. And, um, I, you know, we'll, we'll be a bit controversial here. I've got friends from university and, and school who haven't, who, who gave up their careers and they're, they're finding it hard. They're, their kids are similar age so they're just about to go. And when my kids go, I, you know, I've got, you know, I'm not, I don't want to retire. I, I love every minute of my job. So, um, and it, it becomes, I think, it becomes much more about yourself once your kids have flown the nest. So it's it's wonderful. That juggle was a nightmare, but I think we both would feel. Yeah, I was like you. I I felt I was doing everything terribly. I was a terrible mum, terrible at work, terrible friend. But you slowly rise your head above the waves. And yeah, I'm, I'm almost like that. That's interesting you, say, interesting you say about friends, actually, because I think that's possibly the thing that got pushed onto the back burner that you know you can't really keep up with your friends if you're um a mother of you know if you if, you, if you've got kids that you've got to look after and a full-time job and there were some friends who I've got to know again um now that I've got more time or more time for me I should say um and I'm just very grateful to them that they didn't sort of say oh well you haven't been around much for the last decade uh, and they've accepted me back but um uh, yeah, I think that the, the friendship bit, bit and the and the you know going off and doing stuff and I that I found that that was one thing that I could sort of reduce without too many wheels falling off the bus. If that makes sense. Um, but there were other things that if I reduced them, then things went completely wrong. And and I was a bit of a workaholic, but I don't think that was a bad thing really. I think it probably um it was probably quite a good thing for me. Yeah, yeah, those friendships, they do come back. Good friendships always come back. Now, you have made some amazing contributions to the field of women's health. And as you say, um, I've heard you often say that um, it's women's health from cradle to the grave. Now, let's go back to your contribution to miscarriage and how you set up the miscarriage clinic. And I meet someone all the time who tells me, oh, Leslie Regan, she's so amazing. She helped us when we had a miscarriage. So, you know, you've helped so many people. Tell us about um, why this was important and the issues around miscarriage. 
Well, in the 1980s, I went off to Cambridge. Um, uh, it was 1984, I remember it so vividly. Um, and I, it was my first registrar job. And um, it was a sudden sort of thrown at the deep end in terms of responsibility, because it was a very, very busy hospital. And um, I was in charge at night, you know, and over those long weekends that we used to do then from Friday morning till Monday night, I would meet so many women in floods of tears and very distressed and sometimes quite unwell if they'd been bleeding, coming in with a miscarriage. And they always asked me the same question, why did I miscarry? And I went to the textbooks and um, it just said, oh, well, it's you know nature's way of clearing things up and it's usually due to chromosome abnormalities, which it is. But um, I didn't think that was enough to be able to just dismiss what is the commonest complication of pregnancy. And um, one of my, my colleagues, my mentors up there, in fact, Peter Brody, um, who was also um, he was working as a research scientist with the Medical Research Council there. And he said, well, if there's nothing there, he said, I haven't really thought about it before. There's nothing there. You have to do some research and, and, and find out. And I sort of said, what, me? And he said, yeah, you. Um, and he encouraged me. And in fact, he encouraged me to apply for a little tiny bit of money, which I actually got from not Wellbeing. Of, it wasn't called Wellbeing of Women then. It was called Birthright, oh, yeah. um, the charity that I now wear. Um, and I got a little tiny little bit of money to help run a something or other. Uh, it was like a, a, a survey, um, and I, I just went down to the local radio station and the local TV thing, and I advertised for women to come and join a study so I could follow them up. And long story short, um, it sort of caught on, and um, I started becoming very interested in the immunology of pregnancy. Um, and at that time, there was this famous theory that, oh, you know, the pregnancies miscarry because the mother's the immune system is recognizing that half of the baby is foreign because it comes from the father and therefore she's rejecting it like a transplant. And in fact, I did, I did my MD. I then went to work at the MRC again under Peter's guidance. Um, and I did my thesis on this, 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 this whole thing. Um, and in, in meanwhile, I was doing clinical work and seeing these women and these women voted with their feet. You know, they, they came from all over the place to see me. Um, and uh, my I disproved this whole business about the immune, well, that particular immune theory. And I learned some very difficult lessons doing that because I learned how difficult it is to get a negative result published. Um, and how if there's a, a theme out there of pe that people want to believe, they, they hang on to it and they don't want to, um, they know they don't want to entertain another possibility. Um, but anyway, I persisted. And then when I came down to London in 1990, to my senior lecturer post, my first consultant post, um, so many of these patients followed me. Um, and then um, we set up the clinic and I was never intending Joyce to be an academic. Um, in fact, I think I've only been a half-hearted academic ever, but uh, I was hopeless in the laboratory, absolutely hopeless. Um, and I wasn't very good at statistics either. But uh, um, I did have a very inquiring mind and I was always asking, well, why? Are you sure that's right? Why is that? Um, so uh, I, I, anyway, I applied for the senior lecturer post because that's when I got married um, and inherited these four stepchildren. Um, and uh, so I got, came, took the first job that was available. It was this one, and uh, I thought, oh well, I'll do it for a couple of years, and then I'll, and then I'll, um, I'll get a, I'll go, I'll go back into the NHS and get a proper job. I thought, um, and then of course I got so excited by the wonders of uh, having research fellows and seeing them flourish and do well. Um, I can remember going to a conference about three or four years later after my, uh, into my job and I, I, I was bursting with pride. I had these two research fellows who just swept the floor with the excellence of the things that they'd done. And I just, I thought, thought it was the most extraordinary high. So I know that you only get one high for about nine lows, don't you, in academia, but that's why I stayed. Um, but it was that I enjoyed it, and and I'm very happy to say that those very first two research fellows are, have been my consultant colleagues now for many years, which I thought was also rather lovely. Oh, that's lovely. Um, I I did lab work for many years, and I think I was pretty rubbish at it as well. And I hate statistics; it's really not my thing. So I'm very glad yeah. I've stepped away from the lab. I should have done it earlier, actually. I should have followed you. 
Um, staying on miscarriage, where do, where do you think we are now? Because mm. obviously it's um, it's still quite a high rate. I mean, there's different numbers I see branded around. How common do you think it is and what's the biggest problem? Well, first of all, I think we're much better at diagnosing it and um, and identifying it. We now can recognise that the um, that there are an enormous number of very early miscarriages. That you know, my mother, for example, would never have known because she couldn't access a, an over the counter pregnancy test. Uh, and we've got some women, as you know, particularly in the fertility world, who are testing themselves on day nineteen or twenty of their cycle. So we know that we're picking up all of those. Um, if you like those flashes of a fertilized egg um, or those signals um, and it is very very common I've never been able to meet well I've never met anybody so far who's been able to explain to me why it is that we make so many rubbish embryos as humans because not many other species do that um, and I don't really understand why we you know <laughs> it, it just seems to be such a strange thing and, and such a wasteful way of going about something that's so important. But anyway, we do. Um, and um, uh, I, as I say, I, I, I often now find that women think that they are miscarrying when actually there's actually no evidence that they are. Um, that's a bit of a controversial thing to say as well, because they obviously feel very, very distressed if you point out, well, if you haven't got a positive test, then I'm not sure that you are pregnant. But um, I think it's very difficult because I think um, with the development of the internet, which I'm a great supporter of, and social media, ideas are bandied around that are often not evidence-based. Um, and I'm particularly distressed about that in terms of mis the worlds of reproduction, both fertility and miscarriage, because I think that women and men, for that matter, are very vulnerable in that position. and therefore. If they think that they can do something or spend a sum of money that will help get the outcome they want, then they will often do it. Whereas if it was your, you know, if you said, if you, if I said to you, well, you can do this um, for your liver or your or your your right leg, and you asked me what the success rate was, and I said, oh, it's just ten percent. I mean, you'd probably say, well, why do I want to pay all that money to do that if it's only going to if it's not going to work? But that's not what happens when you're talking about the difference between having a baby and not having a baby so I do think that they're very vulnerable and that's why I think it is very important to carry on always asking where is the evidence where is the evidence that this is actually improving outcome and where is the study that's properly compared this intervention or this drug or or this proposal with um, a sensible control group because there are humans or you know very vulnerable people particularly women uh, at stake here and they get they get a bad deal I think. Oh Lisa, I couldn't agree with you more as as well as those that are are vulnerable and, and trying to get pregnant I, I think we've created now with all this health tech which is exploding um, we're talking about the worried well um, and there's so many myths around women's health you know we've got the we've got the IVF add-ons we've got um, all these menopause supplements there's there's so much tech and improvements and things that people are trying to say will improve your health and, and I I just worry about it and, and back in 2009 I remember you did a terrific program I absolutely loved called Professor Regan Investable I loved that you, you were brilliant yes. you need to redo that because in that program you talked about how some of the com companies use science to sell and I really think we are in, in such a worse position than we were in 2009 and i i've see i see some of these uh, new health tech companies you know they say backed by science one of them says something like 14,000 scientific studies um say that our menopause supplement works or you know hundreds of studies say that our test works what what do you think you know what do you think about where we are now and is there anything that concerns you the most well, it's, 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 it's the sort of complete lack of regulation uh, on what you can put onto the internet or you can put onto your social media platform uh, with no redress if, you've mis if you can be shown to have deliberately misled people. I mean, I, I have to be a little bit careful there because I think some people genuinely believe these things. 
But when you ask them for the evidence, it's often lacking. Um, and, and, and that's, that's really a terrible pity because I so often have women saying, well, why aren't you prescribing this or that or the other? Progesterone is a very good one, both for fertility and thing. Well, the only reason that why progesterone, I think, gets prescribed a lot is because it's cheap and you can administer it yourself as a patient or a woman. Um, and I think most healthcare professionals get up in the morning wanting to help people, otherwise they'd do an easier job, wouldn't they? And so if you come to me and I can give you a something to take away, you feel better and I feel better. Um, and, and I get that. That's, 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 that's human nature. Um, and that's how we respond to each other. Um, uh, but I, I think that I've got an obligation to be talking to women about the fact that there's no evidence that this works. Um, and so you'd be interested to hear, I think, that one of the conversations I have most frequently in my clinic is actually couples coming to see me who have been down the fertility route and they know that I no longer do fertility or IVF work anyway, and I just do the miscarriage and general fertility stuff. And I stepped away from that so that I could have these difficult conversations that go something like, well, why are you having IVF treatment? Because you haven't really got an infertility problem. You've got a miscarriage problem, and you are understandably anxious about the fact it's taking you six months to get pregnant. I mean, I, I'm I'm exaggerating the, the issues there. I mean, some of them are terribly tragic cases, but they need to go to talk to somebody um, who can give them unbiased um, advice and can actually step back and say, well, why are we doing this? And perhaps the best example of all the add-ons and the the tech that has got so complex is if I had a pound for every time a woman asks me, or a man for that matter, um, should they not go off and have IVF with PGTA as a cure for their miscarriage problem? I would be a very, very wealthy woman. And I spend an awful lot of time <laughs> every week talking about this and how there isn't actually very any evidence that, that can confirm that that increases the number of live take-home babies. Yes, the websites, when they say the new cure for miscarriage, are not lying because, yes, you're not going to have an embryo transfer of a genetically abnormal embryo that's been tested. But unfortunately, they're playing on the emotions and the vulnerability of that couple, I think, by saying the new cure for miscarriage, because that couple haven't really come to solve their miscarriages. What they've come to you for is to go home with a live take-home baby. And, of course, as you and I know, Joyce, that doesn't increase the number of live births. And that's actually quite a lengthy conversation to go through it one by one because it's not intuitive and you have to explain all the bits. And then the, the ones that, that those that have done a lot of research, well, they are, yes, but this, that and the other. And then you have to go into the mosaicism and the fact that you're sampling a blastocyst with eight cells in it, perhaps, and that the one you get is not representative. And that's when the look of absolute shock and horror comes over their faces. And sometimes I think, oh, perhaps I should have just left them thinking that PGTA was okay because I've sort of almost unraveled the next bit of hope for them. But And then also I think with that comes real distress that they've been you know, taken for a ride. Oh, yes. It's a tricky one. It's a real tricky one. It's, it's been all of this, these, these treatments and potions and lotions and everything that it's been the bane of my whole career and I stepped away from the IVF and the add-ons which I'd worked on for over 20 years because because it was it was so toxic and it was I felt so angry I still feel angry that we have regulations from our human fertilization and embryology authority we have well, guidance we have guidance from our big European Society of Human Reproduction and Embryology, both which I've been involved with regarding these IVF add-ons, and and it's ignored. And the patients come to you saturated with all this knowledge that they've gleaned from the web, 
and social media. And as you say, it's very, it's very, very hard to undo. And sometimes it doesn't work and, and the doctor will not undo it. And I, and I, I just, I feel we're really preying on, on the vulnerable. And so I stepped away from it because I didn't like the toxicity. And then, and then I can't get away from it because now I've got menopause. I'll come back to menopause toxicity in a minute, but you know, we've got this health tech, you know, I go to lots of health tech events <laughs> and I, I hear some, I was at the RCOG last week and heard some brilliant tech being developed by doctors who in their day-to-day -day job have realized that they could develop a, a tool or procedure that can really help. So that, that's fabulous. But I see a lot of health tech. The main health tech is no disrespect, but it's it's generated by people with lived experiences. They're not a scientist. They're not a clinician. And as you say, there's no evidence. So if you if you made that program again, Leslie, it would you had so you have so much material, you know, from from menopause to um, you know general health to diagnosing PCOS and endometriosis. I'm seeing crazy things there fertility i mean it's it but even general health not just reproductive health it's i think it's um it's it's such a muddied water it's really difficult isn't it yes you're quite right it, it, it was enormous fun actually making that with horizon <laughs> it was um it was just extraordinary the, the team was really great um and I, I had a real insight as well into how much work goes into producing a really good documentary um but that was it they wanted to make sure that science um underpinned everything and yeah. uh yeah but it was it was great but uh yeah anyway there we go <laughs> oh, deep breath deep breath it's a real shame i feel on my deathbed i'll think oh if only everyone had practiced evidence-based medicine i'd have had a happier life <laughs> anyway let's move on let's move on so something wonderful i re i remember when i was a young scientist and hearing that you had become president of the Royal College of Obs and Gynae, and quite amazing that you were only the second woman to ever hold this role and the first for 64 years. So the first chair was Hilda Nor Nora Lloyd in 1949. And then we had to wait uh, till 2016 to have another woman chair. So what's it like? What, what was it like being the second woman president? And why did this take so long? It was extraordinary. It was, it was extraordinary. And, um, because there was such a hoo-ha about it. And, uh, and, oh, and also, you know, I was determined I wanted to get that job because I hadn't intended to. And I didn't want to be president for being the president's sake. I wanted to do it because I wanted to change some things about women's health and things that I thought that I could, I could do and do better and that women would benefit from. And what I realised was that I, I couldn't do that in my local patch at Imperial College or St Mary's or whatever, um, which I tried. And it was just, I couldn't, I needed to get into a leadership role where I could actually try, and I could get to policymakers and get to politicians. I mean, we could have another long discussion about whether healthcare should be within politics, but, you know, we are where we are. And I don't think I'm going to succeed if, in trying to remove it. Um, so I, I really wanted to get that job, and and, and I, I looked carefully into Hilda Lloyd's background, and it's interesting that she was she was the first ever president. She was the first ever female of any college to be a president, or rather, first ever female president of any of the colleges. So, um, the RCOG was ahead of the curve there, and uh, and it was so extraordinary that they were ahead of that curve and appointed her between forty nine and fifty two. Um, the Grumpies say, oh, that's because it was after the war and there wasn't anybody else, which I think is very unfair because she was a quite extraordinarily visionary woman. I read all her diaries um, and she really did have the most extraordinary vision about what she was trying to do. Uh, she she practised in Birmingham. Uh, she met the most enormous prejudice and, and problems and what really interested me in 2016 was that so many of the problems that she was dealing with back 64 years earlier were identical to the ones that I was dealing with. So she had problems with trying to move the older fellows and members to a new, uh, a new location, a new headquarters. And that, that's the story that came into my presidency, too. 
Um, you'll remember the old building in Regent's Park, which was all very lovely looking out over the park, but there were no real people in Regent's Park. Um, and we were on a lease and the Crown Estates, you know, were going to charge an enormous amount of money to renew this lease. And for the past, the previous 20 years prior to my appointment, these all these these male presidents, I'm sure they were very, very wonderful people, but everyone seemed to have ignored um, the fact that the lease was running out. Um, so I had to move the college. But the other things that I dealt with, as you will remember, is I had a big thing about fertility and how it was getting a poor, a poor, um, you know, it was getting a poor divvy of, of, of our time and energy and energy resources. And I also made um, a real stand about how we cannot wash our hands of abortion. Whatever your personal view is, if you've gone into the field of women's health, you have to understand that abortion care is an absolutely key aspect of it and that if you make it difficult to access or you make it illegal that the problem does not go away it just goes underground and that girls and women as a result of that will die so interestingly in her memoirs and her uh, in her diaries Hilda Lloyd was talking about going out with the um the electric flying squad when she was on call in Birmingham and going out there with these newly available blood transfusions and these newly available sulfonamide drugs. And it was quite evident from the descriptions of the women she was looking after that these weren't all women with a postpartum hemorrhage at term. Some of these women were having postpartum hemorrhages in very early pregnancy. So I think she even had that vision. And this is 20 years or nearly 20 years before the 1967 Abortion Act came in. So when I realised that, I mean, it wasn't written overtly, but when I put the pieces together, my respect for her, you know, doubled again, because I thought, what an amazing woman that there she was living in this quite deprived area of Birmingham and recognising what actually makes women's lives tick and then going out and doing something about it at great personal um, danger to herself, I, I would suspect as well. Yeah, well, you're both amazing, amazing women. and. Um, yeah, you, you've both done absolutely amazing work. And tell us more about your. I tell you another funny little anecdote about that. But that um, I was I mentioned there's lots of other women who I think should have become president. And when I took over from my predecessor, um, he he had some rather lovely pictures he was fond of in his office, and so he said, "Would I mind if he took them with him?" I said, "No, not at all." So I had all these bare walls, and I thought to myself, "Well, since this college in the one in Regent's Park was full of." oil paintings of previous male presidents and just this one of Hilda Lloyd I thought right what I'm going to do is I'm going to get hold of some black and white photographs of some of the women I think should have been president and I'm going to blow them up so I blew them up to almost life size and I put them on the walls and they became a tourist attraction Joyce I mean people would come and say can I see the pictures of the women um, and uh, so there we are. So it's a funny little anecdote. So lots of the other women who I think should have been president uh, got an airing on my walls during that time. And I was very pleased when when we moved to Union Street um, in the at the end of 2019. I was really pleased that those those photographs came too, and you can see some of them up on the walls now. Yes, yes, I've been there many times. It's uh, it's great. Um, so. You became chair of Wellbeing of Women. Tell us more about Wellbeing of Women. They do so much amazing work for women's health. Well, I mean, I, I mentioned earlier that they had given me a little tiny bit of money a long time ago, and I'd been a trustee for them for quite a while. Um, and they did actually live at the RCOG. They had their headquarters there for some time, and then there was a fallout between the previous chair and somebody at the college, so they went off separately. Um, and um, when I was president and a vice president and president of the RCOG, I stepped away from being a trustee because I didn't want there to be any conflicts, and I, you know, particularly in view of what had happened in the past. But as soon as I stepped down, um, the old, the ex chair, Sir Victor Blank, who'd been in the role for over 30 years, sort of started this pincer movement, really. He said, You've got to become the chair. And I, I said, Well, Victor, how, how on earth am I going to do that? I don't have your sort of address book. Um, and remember as well, um, Joyce, we were in the middle of a pandemic lockdown, and this was a charity that used to raise all its money by black tie events. And I, I can remember being sort of pushed into this thing, and 
it's sort of saying, right, well, that's it. You'll, you'll have to say yes now. And I think, what on earth am I going to do? Because we can't run any black tie events. You know, we can't do anything. Um, so I sat down with the team, um, with the very lovely Janet Lindsay, who, as you know, is a really fabulous chief executive. Um, and, uh, and I said, look, I think we're going to have to change our focus because we're going to have to think much more about uh, a strategic plan that can help us survive. And to cut a very long story short, I, I was fortunate enough to be introduced to somebody who um, I asked if they would come and help me with this strategy, and he, he did, um, pro bono. And then he then has now, he then became a trustee, and recently I've appointed him to be uh, deputy chair of Wellbeing of Women. Um, a very, very wonderful um, Sri Lankan man and a banker. Who's, in fact, his wife is 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 one of our one of us. She's an OBGYN as well. But um, Sasha helped me with this, and we agreed that we would have to have three pillars to the strategy. Yes, we would continue to fund groundbreaking research because, as you know, um, Joyce, going back over the sixty plus years that the charity has been in existence, um, they have funded you know work on some of the most transformational things and often they've given the startup money to stuff um, like I got my miscarriage money many 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 years ago um, and they started work on HPV and uh, cervical spheres and things like that and they did a lot on ultrasound at the beginning of the years so we wanted to carry on you know funding research um, but I thought well, we also needed to move into the education and advocacy space, which was a big change for the for the for the charity. And I'm really, really appreciative of the fact that not only the chief executive, but the small team, which has now grown over the last couple of years, have been so supportive of that. And we just seem to have hit the right time to do that because um I think it's becoming more and more evident that, you know, empowering women with the information they need to help themselves is probably the piece of the missing piece of the jigsaw that has contributed to women's health having such poor outcomes for such a long time. I really do believe that empowering women and that's through education and advocacy, not just of women, but also of healthcare professionals and everybody else involved. And also trying to adopt the sort of the Michael Marmot approach of how, you know, the healthcare that you and I were taught to deliver only solves about a third of the problem. And the other two thirds are determined by social issues that we live with. And we all pay, you know, we pay lip service to knowing about them, but we don't often do anything about them. Um, and I think because you know, our governments are operating silos, don't they? We've got the Department of Health and then we've got the Department of Education and we've got the DW, the Department of Work and Pensions, and then we've got the Home Office and the Security Services. I mean, all of those people need to be involved if we're going to tackle one of the things that I'm most worried about, which is domestic violence and abuse. You know, you, you, healthcare can't deal with it on its own. It's just not possible. Um because the, the the problem is so ubiquitous and it, it actually involves almost every aspect of society of society and and life so um anyway i felt very strongly about that and fortunately we, we seem to be now actually bringing in more money than we did before so it's actually gone quite successfully so i'm i'm really thrilled about that um and now the team is growing and uh, we've now done sorts, sorts of things that you know in the past everyone was frightened to do um so i run a, a monthly webinar um and we usually, we usually invite um a woman or a girl who is has lived experience of a particular problem and an expert and somebody else who's got perhaps a, an opposing viewpoint about how one should go about looking after this particular problem and then we have a chat for an hour or 55 minutes um, and the the, um, the 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 platform is attracting more and more and more women, and then they're all recorded and they go onto YouTube, and so they can be accessed. Um, and interestingly, we've raised money now over the last few years since I took over in October 2020, with companies and employers um, giving us a donation or a contribution in order to run a webinar or a uh, panel discussion for their employees, for example. 
So something like the menopause um, workplace pledge that you, you will have heard about ad nauseam came out of that. Um, and uh, it's amazing because we've got so many uh, thousands of companies that have signed up. Um, uh, almost every government department has. Um, and, you know, it's almost become a sort of, well, if you haven't got a well-being of women certificate saying that you, you know, you've signed the menopause workplace pledge, you know, don't even bother coming to talk to us sort of thing. So it's extraordinary, isn't it, how once you can get on a roll with something like that, that nobody wants to be, uh, it's the fear of missing out, isn't it, FOMO. You know, no one wants to be missed out of uh, of the feel-good factor. So um, anyway, I, I'm I'm hoping now that uh, this year's campaign, uh, which is just a period, and that's my my next thing. That I'm absolutely determined that uh, we sh we should be talking about menstrual periods in the same free way that we now talk about the menopause, and that it's a topic that's been taboo for so long. But as I often say to the people that I'm I'm trying to convince at this point, you know. What do you know? What what other event happens to human beings quite as often as a menstrual period? So most girls and women that you and I know have 12 periods a year for 40 years of their lives. So, you know, this is actually a part of their existence. And to sweep it under the counter or, or under the table and not talk about it, particularly reckon, reminding, you know, re recognising that one in three women who go to gynecological outpatients have got period problems. and Almost everyone, you know, you will know many girls and women in your life who have to have time off work or time off their education because their periods are too painful or too heavy or too irregular um, and they can't get on with their lives. So I'm on this campaign now. It's called Just a Period and that we're going to stop this being just a period. That this is something we've got to talk about uh, all the time. And I'm, I also think that we've got to get healthcare professionals to understand that they are being very sloppy if they don't ask women about their period. I don't expect the orthopaedic surgeon or, or the nephrologist necessarily to, to know much about it. But if they ask them, how are your periods? Do they ever stop you getting on with your day-to-day -day life? And if the answer is yes, you need to go and get some special help. And I don't think that's any different from me asking you what operations you've had, and what drugs you're taking and what you're allergic to. And, and if I didn't ask you those questions when you came to a consultation with me, I think you rightly think I was being a bit sloppy. So I think it's sloppy not to ask women about this event that happens so often, but can be so disabling. So it's not life threatening, but it's disabling. Oh, here, here, Leslie, here, here. Um, so, yeah, just to remind everyone, the listeners, if they haven't checked out Wellbeing of Women, please go to their website, find them on YouTube and follow the brilliant work that they're doing, really trying to get these conversations going. And, and as you say, Leslie, the just a period. We've we've done two studies on periods recently and we're doing uh, two more this year where we've run focus groups with women. Um, we did a perimenopause uh, group. I wanted to do either start start with doing either end. <clears throat> so we did um, fifteen year old girls and perimenopausal women, and asked them almost <laughs> identical questions. And the the perimenopause has, has been published, but um, the fifteen year old girls we just we've just submitted the paper now, and um, you know they are so thankful that someone is finally talking to them about their period because, as you said, it's been hidden away which is unbelievable and women haven't had the chance to say it and I, I feel so strongly so many women are suffering in silence and they really mustn't that per periods that we're all individual periods will affect every woman totally differently and some will be fine and can continue with their life and have a good quality of life but for some it's really crippling and does have a negative effect and I think because they think oh well, my friend's okay, so I shouldn't complain. I should just get on with it. And and I, I'm sure we both, that is just unacceptable. Women shouldn't just be putting up with these things. And please go and see your doctor. I say this all the time and then people say, oh, but I've tried to see my doctor and they've not been sympathetic. So as you said, we've got to improve the education of, of the health professionals. But Leslie, also the teachers. So the 15-year-old girls told us, that they want their teachers to have training 
in how to support girls at school with their periods because they don't. That's not in the teacher training, which is unbelievable. And the schools haven't been very supportive, unfortunately. Um, so the girls have felt that if they if they start their period or have a problem with their period at school, they will go and ask their friends. They won't go and ask someone at school. And I, I think that's got to change. I think schools have got to be really supportive of um, young girls in school. And everybody, of course, that you say, I say this to, say at the Department of Health or the Department of Education, they agree, oh, yes, yes. But nobody seems to be able to collect the agency together to do something about it. So um, Wellbeing of Women is trying to do something about it now. So um, I've recently got involved with the Harris Academies. Um, and um, in fact, in, in, in January, I went to a... Um, a, a a period workshop um that was run by um a very motivational uh, lady tanya and we went along to one of the schools in south london one of the harris academies um and we collect and i took the, um, the duchess of edinburgh with me who's patron of well-being of women and we had a dozen um 12 young women between the ages of 11 and 18 and we did a, we ran this workshop which was very interactive so Tanya did, did delivered everything with beautiful, beautiful slides, very, very simple wording, emphasizing the importance of proper words for anatomical parts of the body and calling periods, periods, explaining what the cycle was and that, you know, there comes a time when you don't have periods anymore because your eggs have all run out, et cetera, et cetera. And then at the end of this, this session, which went on for about 90 minutes, we had a myth busting session. And she had all sorts of questions, um, you know, that she popped up on the screen. Um, it, was, it was a very interactive sort of group. We were sitting around a big table, but she had, she had a screen that we get all look at. And then we invited um, six sixth form boys to come and join us too. Um, and it was really very very interesting. And they everybody concluded all the all the younger people concluded that they thought that they should be taught with boys. Because yes. they had brothers and fathers and uncles and, and friends um, uh, who didn't know about it. And the boys all thought that they should know about it because they actually wanted to be supportive. There was one young man who was um, Afro-Caribbean who was talking about the fact that if he'd only understood why his mum had got so grumpy, he could have been a lot more supportive instead of a lot more cross and angry with her. Um, and I thought what heartfelt comments, you know, that these are people who wanted to be caring and supportive of their families um, when they're when the women in those families are going through the particular phases of their life but if they don't know about it or, or and they and they've got no information about what they could, might be able to do to help um, then you know they just become I think just just frustrated so it was a really really great thing and the Harris Academy have since come to me and said you know we recognize you can't go around and do this in any of our schools uh, and every year as well, because they need, you need to do it every year um, for the next intake. But um, um, can we record it? And the other thing that I think will be really helpful here is what the what a lot of those school children have told me is that they find it really, really helpful when they're taught by their peers, the senior peers. So I think we've got to do a sort of a train the trainers approach here and be actually training the sixth formers and possibly the first year university students like your twins are going off to be perhaps they could donate once a month once they once a term or something they could donate a couple of hours to go into a school and and, and run something like that because what the, what the young girls and the boys were saying was that they learn most when it's somebody who's nearer their age group than people like me um so you know i'm i'm very well meaning but i am very ancient um and they're probably much more much more likely to absorb stuff from somebody who's coming to them, um, you know, ne nearer their nearer their their their, their decades. Yeah, in my, in my study, the girls were one hundred percent that they wanted to be taught with the boys, and most of them were not. Um, they said it was stigmatizing, and they were very very um, angry about it actually, because then the boys, the boys in their year, had no knowledge or understanding, so they 
you know, they, they gave the girls a hard time because they just didn't understand. And I, I feel I feel very strongly that the teachers, um, yeah, it'd be great to get maybe the sixth form involved. But um, and, and I've done what you've done. I've gone into schools, as you know, um, and I've just gone in like you have just to really see what's happening. But I think we need to arm the teachers with the education of how to deliver this so then they can give the support and it's not it's not difficult so we we i run a i run an international reproductive health education group and we um in a few weeks we've just been finalizing it on monday uh tuesday we've finalized our teachers resource which is it's got a section on on menstruation and um section on fertility section on menopause etc it's got nine sections and teachers can use this as they want to. And we're embarking on a study now with teachers starting in September, where we're going to find out more about what they think about it. What do they want more of? Do they want more questions? And and we're gathering all the resources on these nine different topics. And they'll be on, on our website over the next few months. So I, I think outside agencies and uh, peers and so university students can certainly help. But I think uh, a lot of it has to be given by the teachers so that they use those words. And then if there's something wrong, the, the kids can know, OK, I can go and see, you know, Mrs. Smith. She talked to us about periods. Um, I'm having a problem. I, I can go and talk to her about it. So so I think that's really important. Um, now, I, I wanted to just say a little bit about menopause. Um, menopause is uh, it's it's again, it's become a, this bit of a toxic uh environment out there and um it's i think again for, for the public it's so noisy and they've got to try and navigate you know one person saying one thing one person saying the other so i think it's great we're talking about menopause um but what do you think um about where we are at the moment in the uk with with menopause okay so well i i don't think it's a disease i think it's a transition it's a phase of your life um, and I think that I'm not going to push people to go on to HRT, but as someone who's used it for the last, well, nearly two decades, I think it's marvellous. Um, but, and I, and I, of course, I will attract patients who know that that's my viewpoint and want to come to talk to me often because they've been told that they shouldn't have HRT or they can't have HRT. Um, I, I, um, so, I, I don't think that it's necessarily the right thing for everybody, but I think it's important that they have choices and that the fears that have been um, talked about of breast cancer and of blood clots and things, much of which is not evidence-based or it's been selective interpretation of some studies and ignoring other studies' outcomes, that I think must be sort of debunked or demystified as well. Um, and that we then prevent or we then offer women the information they need to make the right decision for themselves. So, for example, the vast majority of women have no idea that obesity is a much, much bigger uh, risk factor for breast cancer than HRT. Um, and um, so it's those sorts of things that I think we've got to be really concerned about. Um, and make sure that we, we are giving them the information they need to make the decisions that are right for themselves. And that we also take time to unpack the, um, oh, I can't have that bit now. So I, I meet a lot of people who will say, oh, no, I can't possibly put hormones into my body. They're bad for me. And wh when you actually drill down to what it is, it's that they've heard it on TikTok or they've heard it from their mum, you know, and it's, it's the same with HRT. I mean, you'll be, I'm sure, aware of many women who say, oh, I couldn't possibly have a Mirena coil because I can't have a foreign body in, my, in me. It might, it might move around and get somewhere dangerous. You know, it's that sort of myth busting that I think we've got to, um, we've got to key. And it's not about telling people what they need to do. It's about giving them the information they need and helping them get to the conclusion and the decisions that are better them and their lifestyle and they're going to be different i mean i could see three women this afternoon with exactly the same problem and we agree after discussion that we're going to treat it in three totally different ways yeah i'm always asked uh, what advice would you give you know a woman with xxx and i say i, I don't want to give anyone advice 
I want to give them the education so that they then make their own decision about how they want to do it. But but for us setting up the, the UK menopause education and support program, we're working now on the, the first part, which will be we're, we, we need to find a bit of better word, but the moment it's called Menopause 101. So it'll be a one off session where everyone, women and men, can come and learn the nuts and bolts just in a, a, a you know, quick to the point. Um, and lifestyle is going to be major in that, uh, you know, getting your nutrition, your exercise, sleep, mental health, your community and friendships, you know, getting those sorted out, I think is a great starting point, whether you take HRT, don't take HRT, whatever you do, if you're living your life, I think the menopause is like, a, we're lucky we're, we've got this wake up call. Um, okay, you're, you know, you're, we call it midlife, but we're not really midlife, we're over midlife. But, but, you know, if you, as you said about obesity, if you're going to continue in, you know, with, the, with those five pillars of well-being, as I call them, I'm not in check then that's your informed cho choice about how you're going to live the rest of your life because you are in if you don't look after those you're increasing your chance of so so many health conditions so i think that's that's a great wake up call but i, yeah. I want to i want to finish now talking to you about your role that you've done for the last two years as the first women's health ambassador to help implementation of the government's women's health strategy which is to improve the health and well-being of girls and women <laughs> nationally. What do you think are, are the most pressing challenges in women's health today? Uh, we've we've talked about quite a few. What's what's the the biggest hurdle for for women? Well, I think it's twofold. I I, I think there's a general point about how so much of health has been um, investigated and treatments have been planned without including women, uh, which has led to the fact that cardiovascular disease um, is a very significant killer of women and that women die much more frequently than men of cardiovascular disease and they tend to have much more advanced disease when they are, when they are diagnosed because um, their symptoms, presentation and their symptoms are different. And then when and they've got more severe disease when they're diagnosed, and then they're put on drugs that have been in trial in men, and surprise, surprise, they don't have quite the same action in women. So there's, there's that whole generic thing about how women respond physiologically differently to many disorders to men, and that we haven't investigated them and researched them properly. That's number one. And then to give your listeners something to hang on to, because that's a very general point. I think that the biggest problem we face is that contraception has become so very difficult to access. And why I think that's important is not because I'm trying to prevent women having pregnancies. I'm not. Um, but I know that um, I know that pregnancies that are spaced by eighteen months to two years have the very best outcomes. And that pregnancies, by contrast, who have a very short interbirth interval have the very worst outcomes. And they have outcomes that can be um, disabling lifelong. So prematurity, uh, growth restriction, um, uh, damage to babies, um, all of these things uh, are very, very strongly correlate with very short interbirth intervals. So trying to get to the, the, the thing that I would most like to achieve and you said you in the UK and globally would be for every girl and woman that you and I know to be in a position where she can make a decision as to if and when and with whom and how many times she becomes pregnant and she needs to be empowered to make those decisions for herself and also to have immediate access to any form of contraception that helps her do that planning of her life because it is a major life event uh, bringing another person into the world and it alters us as we know um, and there's nothing wrong with that and however many times you want to do it but I think women have got to be in charge therefore of their own fertility and it's such a simple thing to do and it's so cheap 
so cost effective. You know, contraception is the single most cost effective intervention in the whole of healthcare. Mm. Um, and yet it has been downgraded. Um, it's not even that it's downgraded. It's just that I think we've been too complacent in the UK and we think, oh, yeah, yeah, well, that's simple. We've, we've sorted all that out. And actually, currently, it is nobody's business to ensure that contraception is universal for all girls and women in this country. Nobody is in charge of it. It slips between everybody's, um, slips down the gaps of everyone's portfolios. And of course, if you are not responsible for picking up the pieces of when something goes wrong, there isn't much incentive to do it right either. And that's exactly what has happened. It's been commissioned in these silos that don't talk to each other. And therefore, it's really, really difficult. So, um, you know, I'm sure you meet women all the time who can't access a myrena coil or they can't mm. access this or they can't access that. And it's nothing to do with the fact that there's a shortage or that they're stupid or they don't know about it. It's because um, someone has got to pick up the bill for it and it's in somebody else's patch and nobody wants to do it in their patch. Yeah, it's a, it's a very crazy system. And I, I do have so many people who, so there's a two three month waiting list to get a coil and uh, yeah it's it's uh, it's unbelievable um t leslie tell us about the women's health hubs that i've heard you talk about many times well this is my this is my um uh, uh, my my solution if you like to all of those maintenance things that i want women to be able to access so you know you and i are great believers in looking at women's health across a life course and we know that most of these things are predictable it's not that they suddenly come out of nowhere and we don't know what to do they are predictably going to happen and i think that because the nhs is cash strapped um, because we're all living much longer and our expectations are much higher we've got to now look at different ways of delivering health care and emphasizing health care rather than disease intervention mm. And I'm hoping that these health hubs will be the answer. They don't have to be a place. They can be a virtual one and they can be lots of different models. It shouldn't be one size fits all. It could be a virtual model. It could be a hub and spoke. It could be a procedural hub. It could be a pop-up. You know, I've seen this pop-up clinics or hubs, uh, traveling ones that visit um, some in Manchester a van which goes to the main station um, and various other locations. Um, and the Bush Telegraph is very, very efficient. Lots of women there who are um, drug addicts, homeless, um, gypsy, Roma, they all know when it's coming um, and that they can, get, they can access things. So it, I, somebody asked me recently, the Department of Health, well, can you put all this into a nutshell? And so I said, OK, so the nutshell is that I don't think any woman that you or I know needs to go to secondary care for the management of an abnormal sphere or a colposcopy or even a small procedure on the cervix or her menstrual health problems or her contraception or her menopause management or her problems with her irritable bladder in the first instance. I think all of this should be done close to home and hopefully in, a, in the one place. And then if your interventions into that irritable bladder with some physio and perhaps some anticholinergics doesn't work and the problem remains, that's when you need to go and see a specialist urogynecologist. Um, and if the contraception you know, proves to be more complicated and, and it needs more expert advice, well, OK, then that's sensible then to go into uh, a gynecology clinic and speak to somebody with specialist expertise but not in the first instance this is ridiculous i mean we've got uh, and the the, the the areas where women's hubs have actually achieved this have done a most amazing job at slashing secondary care waiting lists. so there's one that i'm particularly fond of up in uh, south manchester where only 10 percent of all the women who attend this particular community uh, facility now ever have to go to secondary care. Um, the current president at the RCOG, Rane Thaka, she's the Euro urogynecologist, and by giving um, physiotherapists and general practitioners and pharmacists access to physio and uh, bladder drill and some prescribing um, uh, arrangements for various medications, she has got 50% of her urogynecology waiting list. And therefore, she's only seeing people who've got real problems. 
and who need much more um, much more sophisticated care. So I'm not trying to downgrade it all. I'm just saying that in the first instance, you shouldn't be waiting months and months for a coil. You need to be able to have one when you want one. And then if that doesn't suit or your periods are still painful and heavy, well, then perhaps we need to think about something else. But it, most of the women that come to see me in clinic shouldn't be there. That will be so wonderful, Leslie. Let's do it. Let's do it. Um, and Leslie, it's my not, yeah, it's we, not rocket science. I know. I keep saying this, not rocket science. Um, my final questions, Leslie, to all my guests. So I've called my podcast. Why didn't anyone tell me this? Because I've I'm asked, uh, told this so many times. Now, have women told you? Have they have they said this to you? Why didn't anyone tell me this before? And if they did, what's the main thing that they asked? Well, they say it about a lot of things, but I suppose numerically answering your question, it's that their fertility isn't endless. Mm. Um, and so many women will tell me that they, they just wish that someone had told them that their egg quality was going to start deteriorating at a certain age um, and that this was going to be a problem for them. It would save a lot of heartache. Um, and, and some of the things about periods, for example, that I was mentioned earlier, I haven't repeated about how, you know, if they stop you going to work, then actually they are a problem. And it doesn't matter what your granny and your mum said about, well, you know, you're a girl, so that's just what happens. You know, you need to go and get help for that because you need to get on with your life. Um, and my comments also about obesity, I think there's an awful lot of, um, an awful lot of um, trying to merge the problem of obesity and not tackling it. Uh, people say you can't go around fat shaming people. I, well, OK, I'm not trying to fat shame anybody. I'm just trying to get them to understand that this is going to have real consequences and that I can't actually do that bit for them. I can do lots of other things, but I can't make them lose weight or change their diet um, unless they are motivated to do so. So I think those are the things mostly. Yeah, my, my top one is female fertility decline and our international groups doing a lot of work around this we've got so many things coming out on our website in the next few months and um yeah this this um the, the whole issue around language nowadays and i think some of us are walking on eggshells thinking you know we shouldn't do this and we should you know, i was told off the other day i'd made a short video for international menopause day and i was in a rush i was at a conference and then someone said you didn't say the word woman and i was like what <laughs> it was like one minute long video saying ha happy international menopause and i was like so yeah the whole thing about obesity and not being able to say that uh, we have we are saying it in our international leaflets that we're and um, videos and things that we're doing we are saying that um i think i think we've been careful how we say it but, but we have said it so so let's see what motivates you sorry carry on what motivates me um well you know I suppose I, I just love a challenge. Um, and I, I love that bit about, well, when someone says, well, no, you can't can't do that. And you say, well, why not? And they say, well, because we don't do it that way. And one of the things that my team at the Department of Health now quote me on um, is me saying, well, I tell you what, why don't we just do it and see? <laughs> um, and, uh, you can always, and I often say to them, you can always blame me and say it was my fault and we can ask for forgiveness later on. But I think it's... it's um, you know, I suppose the motivation is, is, is trying to achieve change, not for change's sake, but when I can see there's an obviously better way to go about, in my case, delivering health care or, or I suppose it's getting, it's sort of looking at the goal and trying to work out how you get there. And I think often what I found that I need to do first and foremost is to work out in my head who that's going to upset and who's likely to put up a barrier to it. And if you can identify those, then you can embrace them and get round them because you can then usually persuade people. So I suppose motivating is, is the answer to is tackling a challenge and also being a successful advocate. And I think advocacy is about persuading people to think differently and therefore to act differently. And that does motivate me. When I hear when I hear somebody in the policy world or the political world quoting back to me something that I've said repeatedly, I think, oh, we've got it over the line. And I, and I do find that very motivating. 
it's very frustrating as well because you often have to do it many, many times. And I'm not in any way wanting to be facetious or patronising to the people I'm working with, not at all. But they're skilled at other things that I'm not skilled at. But I think I think the most yeah, being a good advocate is probably my biggest motivation. And and keep up that that fabulous work. Um, the last couple of questions: What makes you happy, and where is your happy place? Oh, well, um, what makes me happy? Well, my daughters make me very, very happy. Um, and, and music makes me very happy as well, and the theatre, but particularly music. So I suppose one of my happy places is going to the promenade concerts every summer. I can often, I can often be found there, um, sometimes every night of the week. Um, I love that. Um, and my really happy place is some... Um, Having scruffy, scruffy supper with my twin daughters, um, with uh, uh, with lots of joking and laughter. Um, I'm always the the victim of all their jokes because when they're together, I expect your twins do the same. Joyce, they they, they rather gang up on you, don't they? Um, and uh, but I but I absolutely adore it. And as I said earlier, I'm I feel so lucky and so privileged that they they want to maintain this close friendship, and that's so special because I I often say think to myself, you know. You always love your children, but sometimes you don't always like them. And I absolutely, I really do like my daughter's company. I can remember my my NCT class, um, when, when I was pregnant with my first, they said, to me, what are you worried about? And I said, I'm worried that we won't get on, uh, that we won't like each other, because I know too many people that don't like their parents. And I, that was my number one fear. But I'm re I've been a single yeah, one. Yeah, agreed. Yeah, I've been a single mum for 11 years and we are ridiculously close. So I, I, they're, all, they're all boys. Uh, but yeah, I feel very, very privileged to have that wonderful relationship with them. The very final question. Yeah, and, I, and I'm also single. Sorry, sorry. Yeah, go on. Yeah, like, carry on. No, I said, I'm also single now. I said, I'm, you know, and somebody says, oh, are you married? I said, no, I'm very happily divorced. <laughs> He's happier and I'm happier. So that's great. <laughs> I, I have loved being single. I feel so free. And um, yeah, it's, it's, it's pretty good. Um, the very last question, what advice would you give your younger self? Oh, um, well, firstly, that opportunities rarely make appointments. You've got to grab them or you lose them. Um, and for some reason, I think it was probably my father instilled in me that because I've done some weird things at times um, with, 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 and there's been no plan for them, but I, I always, I've always been glad that I've done them. Um, but I suppose the most important thing is something I've learned much more recently and that is that you can travel an awful lot farther and faster in life if you stop fussing about who's getting the credit mm. and you include everybody else. Um, and it just, partnership working um, is the key, I think to all the things that go wrong in the world or that well the lack of partnership working is the key to everything that goes wrong and it is the key to success i think very very wise words i always say that what i've done in my career is surround myself with people that know more about something than i do <laughs> exactly it's actually you know, when i was talking about my other research fellows at the beginning at an earlier point in our conversation i mean some people get very threatened by them becoming so expert I just thought it was so wonderful. And I, any new PhD or MD student, I'd say, now, listen, if you don't leave this, this, this time with me, far more expert and knowledgeable than I am, then I failed. you. Yeah, yeah. And, and give them, as you said, give them credit. You know, you don't, we, we don't, I think that's su such a wonderful thing to do. Don't, you don't steal the credit for yourself. A appreciate who's, who's done yeah. it. So, Leslie, it was. I'm so glad. I've been. We've been trying to get a date in the diary since I first started the podcast, which was over a year ago now. And apologies as always. I live in a village and I have terrible Wi-Fi, so I always have a little bit of a lag with um with my guests. So sometimes there's a little bit of uh, over talking, which I always try to avoid. But but my Wi-Fi is so. I'm going to shout out to GigaClear who have put the cables in and not connected anybody. <laughs> they're driving us mad but leslie thank you so much and it's just a, ple a pleasure to My know pleasure. You, a pleasure to work together so good luck with all of the things you're doing 
Well, you're going to be involved in many of them, I know. So thank you very much indeed. And thank you for doing this series of podcasts, which I'm sure gives a lot of people a great deal of pleasure. Thank you very much, Leslie.